Interview and job search strategies that work. I'm here with Scott Haddix. Hey, Scott, so uh, tell us about yourself. You know, uh, how did you get started in your current role? Well, it's, it's, it's kind of been an evolution of things, you know, being in the right place at the right time. Um, so I, I went in this in the military right out of high school. As a matter of fact, I wasn't even 18 yet. And, and, and that's interesting because I've worked in Africa quite a bit, and uh, they talk about child soldiers. And I haven't one soldier in Africa that wasn't allowed to, uh, or that was allowed to enlist before he was 18. Uh, and there I was in boot camp at 17. So I went to Navy boot camp at age 17. Um, and uh, it was, uh, it was very, very, uh, I mean, it was, it was life changing. Let's just say that, you know, you've got people yelling and screaming at you uh, to do things and you get used to it in, in a demented sort of way. Um, but uh yeah, I went to Navy Nuclear Power School and ended up flunking out of that. And uh, when I uh, was asked by uh, then Senior Chief, now retired Master Chief Sprinkle, if I wanted to try out for the uh, for Buds for the Navy SEALs, I was so I mean I had I had uh, flunked out of nuke school, so my confidence was really low. So I told him no. And that's why one of the biggest regrets of my military career was that I didn't give that a chance. Um, but I, I, we joke that uh, Navy stood for never again volunteer yourself. Uh, but I volunteered for everything when I was in the Navy. I mean, uh, I ended up being on uh, a weapons handling ship. And I volunteered for the nuclear weapons handling team. And I got to go to some really nice training with that. Um, I did some, they did a lot of counterterrorism training with with uh you know the nuclear weapons handling team so i got good experience with that ended up in the persian gulf uh on a minesweeper of all things and uh i was uh i was an electrician so i was going to be in the engine room what's well, 120 degrees over there they said we need somebody we need guys to volunteer for mine watch up on the folk on the pony part up front and you get an m14 and m60 Pair of binoculars and uh, combo gear. They said, but you have to be an expert shot. So we only want to talk to guys who've been an expert shot. Well, fortunately for me, I, I grew up around guns, so I had an expert qualification. So I ended up uh, on on the uh, pointy part of the ship instead of down in the engine room. And I'd say that was a blessing. But uh, yeah, I could spend my birthday out there. And then the Vincennes shot down the uh, Iranian Airbus, and uh, things got real crazy. People got shot at. We got shot at. They uh, shot a um, Chinese silk missile at us. Just missed us, as a matter of fact. Um, but that was, you know, over 30 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> then I got off active duty. Um, and start working in security. And uh, one of the uh, security uh, secretaries, she's sure her husband was a uh, uh, police officer locally there in Ann Arbor area. Actually, it was Pittsfield Township. And she said, uh, they're hiring for reserve officers. She said, uh, I think I think you'd be great at that. So I went down and I applied. They, they took three of us and I was one of the three. So I went to the Reserve Police Academy Came back, was started working for another security company. They had a lot of a uh, lot of former law enforcement or guys that were moonlighting it that were currently in law enforcement. And there was a little township just north of Detroit called Royal Township. It still exists, but they don't have their own police department anymore. They used to have their own police department. And uh, the head of the narcotics area uh, was a sergeant. He said, uh, I'll leave his name out, but uh, he said uh, he works for the same security company that I did. He said, do you want to go uh, kick down uh, crack house doors in Detroit? I was like, you got to be kidding me. He says, no, he says, we're just north of 8 Mile. So all the drugs that are coming into all the Section 8 housing are coming from Detroit. So as long as we have a Detroit officer uh, with us, 
we can go kick doors. He says, but I don't have enough people because it's a small department. So, so next thing you know, I went from a reserve officer to kicking down crack house doors in Detroit. I'm like, what the is going on? So, I mean, yeah, you could say, uh, did I get paid for it? No, I didn't. But it was an experience that you you you, you can't put a price tag on. Um, you know, <laughs> he said, are you a sworn officer? I said, yes, I am. And I was. So I got to go kick doors in Detroit uh, crack houses. And that was a learning experience all in itself. Um, years later, I, uh, I moved to Indiana, got married, um, and, and were, was a drill, drill instructor at the juvenile boot camp there and um, took care of uh, k- struggling kids, at-risk youths, as they call them. And uh, so then they said, uh, they've got an opening on the hostage negotiation team. Do you want to try out for that? And I was like, sure. So I went. and. Uh, applied and they accepted me and I went to the hostage negotiation school and that was great. I mean, that was, that was extremely interesting to say the least. Um, then they said, uh, we have a SWAT team it's called CERT, special emergency response team. Uh, would you be interested in being on that? I said, yeah, sure. What the heck? So, <laughs> so I applied for that, tried out for it, was accepted, went to the two week SWAT Academy. Holy cow. Uh, that was that was a lot of training. It was very interesting, to say the least. Um, and I did that for a couple of years. Um, all the while, I was still in the reserves, uh, naval reserves. I made it into. Uh, I volunteered and made it into the mobile intro undersea warfare unit, and uh, that was probably the the next best thing for me. Uh, to to being I don't know I guess being uh, infantry or or being uh, in the Marines or at the Army and uh, we did a lot of crazy stuff uh, a lot of fun stuff we did counter narcotic stuff down in the Caribbean and uh, so switching back and forth you know I got a civilian job where I'm a drill instructor at a juvenile boot camp and I'm I'm I made I ended up being the assault team leader on the SWAT team, on the CERT team, and uh, doing uh, stuff with the mobile intro undersea warfare unit. Uh, out of It was actually based out of Toledo, Ohio, but they were never there. I mean, we, we traveled all over. I mean, we were up and down the East Coast, um, everywhere from Florida to uh, New Hampshire, uh, training. And... Uh, then, then we had some real-world missions in Korea, um, and and I'm, I'm not going to talk about those, but uh, you can read about them uh, if you want to read about how South Korea tried to find uh, the uh, North Korean submarines in '95, '96, and how the North Koreans, some of them, well, in '96 when the guys uh, got in, North Koreans got into South Korea, uh, yeah, they they rounded all of them up. But uh, yeah, some, I mean, right place, right time. I guess is, is what it comes down to for me. I mean, that's why I look at it. I've been so blessed that I've been able to do certain things. What uh, what excites us about your so your current job, right? Can you talk about that at all? What you do? My current job. Well, right now, I mean, <laughs> well, let's see. Uh, I switched from the Navy to the Army. I went uh, to infantry school, uh, became an officer, went to infantry officer basic course, which is essentially like a pre-ranger school, um, and uh, ended up going to Africa. And, uh, well, I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. So my, my, uh, the balloon went up, and I was supposed to go to Iraq. And so they – took me through medical and uh, I told them, I said, well, I have multiple sclerosis. And they said, well, you're going home. So I was medically retired. That was one of the hardest things I ever did, uh, which was telling them the truth. But I mean, you know, you learn when you go through OCS, I will not, you know, well, is it uh, uh, lie, cheat or steal or tolerate those who do. 
So I didn't want to be a liar, so I told him the truth. So I got um, I got medically retired. Well, luckily I'd been through infantry officer basic course, and uh, a job came up in Africa as a contractor to train on the ACODA program. Uh, ACODA stands, it's through the U.S. State Department, you can look it up. It says for African Contingency Operations and Training Assistance. And from February 2008 to November 2014, I was training African troops off and on from, let's see, Nigeria, Ghana, uh, Uganda, Rwanda, Djibouti, um, all those places. And that was probably the best best job. I, did it pay? Yes, that paid. And it paid very well, I might add. Um, but there again, that all came from, from what? From having my medic, my military experience. Had I not had my military experience, I would have never have gotten that job. Um, it was it was a great experience. I stopped doing that in 2014. Got uh, had had a surgery. Uh, had a hernia. Um, so it wasn't very good for for my marriage, unfortunately, as well. And uh, so I finished that. Then <laughs> I I found out that they were doing uh, fetal stem cell uh, therapy in uh, Ukraine. And uh, so I went over to Ukraine, paid about ten grand, and uh, got some fetal stem cells um, implanted. I uh, wife and, and wife and I ended up separating for about a year and a half, and I ended up back over there on the front lines. Well, I volunteered. I volunteered. I met a guy uh, from Kenosha, Wisconsin, who knew some people. And they got me up to the front lines where the where the Ukrainians are fighting the Russians there in the Donbass region, and uh, I I found out some of the problems that they were having and uh, did did a little ad hoc training with them, um, and that was the the language barrier was was the hardest part. But I there was luckily there was a, a guy there that could translate for me, so I used a dry erase board and the translator and and said hey. You know, don't put guys out at uh, traffic checkpoints if you don't have patrols or counter snipers that can cover them. Because they were just putting guys out there uh, at checkpoints to stop traffic, you know, to to check traffic, make sure there weren't any Russians roaming around. And that's a good idea. But they weren't they didn't have any backup. They didn't have any any patrols or counter snipers. And and Russians were just sniping these these checkpoint guys off left and right. And. uh I said, hey, if you don't have the manpower to back up your checkpoints, don't be putting them out there because you're just putting out targets, what you're doing. And uh, so that was that was a great, great learning experience for me. I mean, no, <laughs> um, I had previously contracted in, uh, in Kazakhstan. I trained uh, the Kazakh Airborne Brigade. So that was my first run-in with training in Russian. Uh, I learned a little Russian, but not enough to train and that's for sure. Um, that was back in 2010, and this was like 2015, and I'm I'm in uh, Ukraine, working with Ukrainians. Um, it was it was uh, enjoyable to say the least. Um, but uh, I've had my surgery, so so my hernia is all better now. So I've decided to take it easy now. So now I'm an Arizona Ranger, and uh, I teach I teach uh, history in high school. Uh, when we can, so that's what I'm currently doing. So from all of that exciting stuff, you know, bullet dodging and and uh, teaching, training soldiers from everywhere from Kazakhstan to Ukraine to Africa uh, to to now quiet little uh, Arizona Ranger, which is basically a Mojave cop. We back up other law enforcement agencies throughout the state of Arizona. We have 20 companies in the state of Arizona, and uh, yeah, I mean, I'm 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 a sergeant, but the reason I'm a sergeant is because I'm a chaplain, and I'm a chaplain with the Peoria Company of the Arizona Rangers, and uh, I've got some great stories, obviously, that I can look back on, reflect back on. I'm getting to be 53 years old, so it's it's time to slow down, spend some time with the family. Got back with my wife and. Uh, 
got to see my daughter graduate high school, my youngest. So the older ones are having, my oldest is having grandbabies. She just had her second. So now I'm, now I'm, I'm relaxing, teaching high school and uh, doing the hobby cop stuff. Wow. So you're actually teaching. That's great. You're teaching high school. That's, uh, that's great. I mean, obviously I don't know that you, you could, uh, so obviously, so I asked everybody this question actually on the podcast and it's, it's really like based on your experience, um, what advice would you give somebody working at McDonald's who's trying to get into the field you're getting to, or who's trying to get in into the job you have? Right. And, and as a high school teacher, I, I mean, I hear that all the time because kids, they come up to me and they ask me questions and stuff. And I tell them, well, you know, when I did this, and they're like, you did that? And I was like, yeah. And they're like, how do you get to do that? <laughs> And I tell them, I say, first thing you need to do, I, in my opinion, is is to go to basic training, go to boot camp for one branch of the military. Find out what you want to do. I mean, uh, I just had a, a young lady uh, graduate uh, from, from, I helped her through her math class, and uh, she, she graduated, thank goodness, and um, she was going to Marine Corps. She took the ASVAB, but she didn't do so good. She's going to retake it. And... Uh, I got a Marine buddy of mine that, uh, Dan, that, that, uh, I, uh, I work out with at, uh, Luke Air Force Base gym and, uh, he's, he's going to help her out. So she gets a higher score so she can get into what she wants to get into in, in the Marine Corps. That's what she wants to do. She wants to be a Marine. I'm like, that's great. So yeah, my, my recommendation is go in the military, do your four years as an enlisted guy, at least. I mean, I did. How many years enlisted? I did 14 years enlisted yeah, and did the last six as an officer. So, um, you know, I, I mean, when I switched from the Navy to the Army, I went from uh, E5 to E6. I went through the what they call BNOC. They don't call it that anymore. But they used to call it BNOC, Basic Non-Commissioned Officer Course. And uh, while I was in that, they said, hey, you got enough college credits, you could go to OCS, you want to be an officer? I said, yeah, sure, why not? So I went to OCS and became an officer. And then went to infantry officer, and I met some of the greatest guys. I mean, the 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 uh, first, probably the only, free fall mission in Iraq was conducted by a guy I went through uh, IOBC, infantry officer basic course with. And, uh, I mean, that's great. The guy that owns or that runs beyond SOF, which if you go in the military and you get some skills and you come out and you want to be a civilian contractor, he's the guy. His name's Steve Brignoli. He runs beyond SOF. Guess what? He and I went through, we're in the same class of, of if you're also basic course. So, I mean, he's, he's a great guy. I mean, he's, he's done so much. I mean, he's, I don't know. He's chairman of the board of, of all these different organizations now. And I knew him when he was a second lieutenant. <laughs> so yeah, you make great contacts. You make, you meet interesting, great people. There's a book called the commandos by Douglas C. Waller. And, uh, he, t- he, he gets to go through Doug Waller goes through, uh, with a class. Oh, oh but shoot me with a buds class. It's going, you know, become seals. And, the officer in that class is Tom Rancic. I knew Tom Rancic when he was an ensign in the Navy. He and I were on the same ship. We were stationed. I met his wife before he did, for crying out loud. I mean, I've met some some really great, great people, and all through the military. So I would definitely say, first thing you want to do is plan out your military future. Spend three, four years in the military. Check it out. No, that's great advice, actually. That's great advice. Yeah. Um, so the la- the last question I'll ask you, right? I won't take much of your time. I know your time is busy. Uh, I'm, rather, your time sure. is important to you. So um, I wanted to know, like, how uh, – tell people how they can get in contact with you. You know, social media, you have a YouTube channel. You have a, you obviously have a Twitter, but if you could just talk about that. Yeah, no, I, I don't have a YouTube channel because, yeah, I mean, I've I've never really – thought of myself as a very interesting the kids that that uh 
I teach school thing I'm interesting. <laughs> and I guess my wife probably thinks I'm interesting, but I've no, I never YouTube channel. Um, I'm on LinkedIn, Scott Haddix, uh, uh, Facebook, same, uh, Scott Haddix and, um, uh, Twitter, Scott Haddix, but I, I don't tweet that often. Um, I don't, I don't have a lot to tweet about. I mean, usually what I do is, is when I check my Twitter and I find stuff that I find interesting, which is usually stuff from Tim Kennedy, uh, I, I retweet it cause he's always on Twitter, but, uh, yeah. That's about it as far as getting a hold of me. Yeah, my my email for the Arizona Rangers is s haddix h a d d i x at azrangers dot gov. Well, Scott, I really appreciate you coming on the podcast today. Thanks a lot. Um, I I know a lot of people will get a lot of knowledge out of this. Um, is there anything else you want to say? Um, you know, anything else you'd like to say? Not that I can think of. I mean. Uh, like I said, I was just at uh, ASU's downtown campus in in Phoenix, and I was talking about it. I said, uh, I said all of my opportunities have come because I volunteered for stuff. So I would say, you know, some of your some of my best oppor- some of my best experiences have come from volunteering. And we used to joke that Navy stood for never again volunteer yourself. But man, I tell you, if I hadn't volunteered for all the things I've volunteered for, I wouldn't have the experiences. <laughs> 